T.D. Jakes is suing another bishop. Should this happen? And, and what's going on anyway? I'm Professor Brooke Gurley. I'm back with my father, Pastor Jerry Gurley. We're here to discuss this. All right, so let's get into this. On Monday, Bishop T.D. Jakes filed a lawsuit in Pennsylvania, and he alleged two counts. One, defamation. The other one is conspiracy to commit defamation, or actually the first one was a libel per se. So the different allegations, and I'm, like I said, I'm here with my father. We'll discuss these. But before we get into it, Dad, what's your initial thoughts in, in this and what's going on? Well, my initial prayer, my sincere prayer, is that this is uh, the allegations that have been made against Bishop T.D. Jakes, particularly uh, those that were made by uh, Bishop uh, Youngblood. His name is Dwayne Youngblood. My initial thought is, my God, I hope that this is not true. Because if it is true, it will be profoundly devastating uh, to the church, to the Black church in particular. Right. And I would agree with you on that. I, you know, I don't know. I hope it's not true. It would be, like you said, devastating. I don't want it to be true. And that's not really even the point of what we're talking about here, but uh, whether or not he did it. But I, I'm with you. I think that it would be a devastating blow to the African-American community or to even the religious space to have a bishop um, being guilty of these things. But that time will tell. For now, though, I want us to sort of look at the the complaint itself, right? So like I said, there are two counts. It's a 20-page complaint. A lot of it are the facts of the case, which even I was surprised. I don't know about you, Dad, because you read it too. I was surprised about the detail that he gave and the, the facts of the case. You kind of, you would think he would want to sort of just sort of downplay that. Um, but one thing that he definitely put in there are the allegations against Youngblood, right? Like he goes right. into details there about young background. Can you go into that? Yeah, I mean, what he says in the lawsuit was uh, over 40 years ago when he was 18, and that raises a legal question. Right. We'll get to that hopefully in just a moment. But when he was 18, uh, essentially uh, he was at a, a meeting where T.D. Jakes was. He was actually in a room, in a private room, and when he prepared to leave the room, T.D. Jakes positioned himself uh, in such a way as to obstruct his path. And as he tried to go beyond T.D. Jakes, T.D. Jakes grabbed him uh, in a non-spiritual way and attempted to kiss him. Um, and again, we have to say, of course, that T.D. Jakes has denied this. Right. But that's the allegation in the lawsuit that T.D. Jakes filed. Because, of course, defamation, we have to talk about what that is. And, and we should tell, tell the audience, because I think they may be thinking, well, why? what makes us particularly qualified, uh, don't you think, Professor Brook, to discuss legal matters? Because we're getting ready to have a conversation about the law. Right. So what, what are your credentials that would make you somewhat qualified? Just a little qualified. you know. So I am an attorney, a civil rights attorney, and I am a law professor. So I know a little something. You that. might be slightly qualified, and I'm just a humble civil rights lawyer, and and we of course both have taken uh, college courses, law courses that deal with uh, these types of allegations, defamation. So the claim is, as you said, uh, against uh, Bishop Dwayne Youngblood, it is defamation, and let's talk about what defamation is. Defamation is essentially saying something that you know is not true, communicating that untruth to a third party. So if you're talking about, say, me, Jerry Gurley, if you talk to me directly and you say, you are a liar, or a thief, and a murderer, even though that's not true, it's not defamation because you have not involved a third party. Which is called publication. Right. And so that's exactly right. So then if you then go to Jane and you say, uh, you know, I'm sorry to tell you this, but Pastor Gurley, Attorney Gurley is a liar. He's a thief and a murderer. Now you have published it. Right. And that makes it uh, defamation. So uh, different uh, theories or torts have subparts that are called elements. Mm -hmm. And there are three elements to this tort. A tort is a civil wrong. A crime is a criminal wrong. So there are three parts to this tort. Right. 
untruthfulness, the publication of that untruthfulness to a third party, and three, damages. Right. Although if this, because this is liable per se. Per se. And what does that mean technically? Liable per se, just like on the face of it, certain things such as accusing someone of criminal activity, which is what you have here. If it's liable per se, then you don't have to prove um, special damages. Right. It, so is have- presumed, yeah. it is presumed that there's a rebuttable presumption that it is harmful. Right. Uh, to now, there's also, there's also something special here because uh, Pat, Bishop T.D. Jakes is a public figure. So how does that impact? The well, you're talking about the New York Times v. Sullivan standard, I believe, which says that if someone is a public figure, and, and that typically is going to be an elected official, but certainly you can be a public figure if your face is on television, if you are in the in the public space and, and you're well known, and I would argue that uh, T.D. Jakes is a public figure. Yeah. What that then means is really that there's a higher standard, right? Because what is assumed is that if you're in the public space, people are going to talk about you all the time, and a lot of times what they say is not going to be actually truthful. But that comes with the territory of being a public figure. Right. So what that does is enhances the burden of proof for TD Jakes. Right. And that proof being actual malice. Right. So you have to show that they said it with malice. And this is important because I saw someone discussing the lawsuit and said, oh, but, but, um, Pastor Youngblood did this with malice. And said, I don't believe he did it with malice. And I'm like, well, no, that's the pleading standard. You have to say that he did it with malice because, again, like you said, uh, Bishop Jakes is a public figure. I would argue that he is. Now, Definitely. that is a matter of argument, you know, uh, and and I believe, and, and I'm not an expert in defamation, but I believe that that would be an affirmative defense that is asserted on the part of the uh, defendant, in this case, Bishop Youngblood, Dwayne Youngblood, meaning this, that it would be his burden to prove. Normally, if you file a lawsuit whoever brings the lawsuit, it's their obligation to prove everything. The, the, the person that is being accused don't have to prove anything. Right. But if you assert a defense, if you say, actually, here's my defense, then you have the obligation to prove that defense. All right. So we're getting into the technical legal weeds. Right. And I just want to sort of clarify why there's certain language. If you do read the, the lawsuit, why you see certain things like with malice, it's not happenstance. It's not random. These are legally significant terms that we're putting into that they're right. putting into their lawsuit. Um, another claim. So that's the first claim is libel per se. Um, the second one is conspiracy to commit defamation. And there you have um, Bishop Jakes actually lists um, Bishop Dwayne Youngblood and then unknown defendants. John unnamed. Young, unnamed. Thank you. Unnamed. unnamed. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of them, and especially with regards to the second count of a conspiracy, it seems clear to me that the person, at least one of the co- co-conspirators is Larry Reed. Now, Larry Reed is this well-known or and- popular within the African-American or gospel Christian community. Um, he was a former pastor. Now he kind of does his own thing, you know, his own spiritual, He's a spiritual, uh, spiritual leader in a spiritual but organization, very, but right. not necessarily a quote unquote pastor. Right. He was a pastor, traditional sense. At now, 19 years old, he was a pastor. Right. Now he has his own thing. I used to follow him on social media. Now I just sort of I receive his things from other people. But he's kind of like, if you want to know what's going on within the gospel Christian community, he has the latest information because people send him things and he's well connected. And so the um, Bishop Youngblood came on his show and it was that interview it was two parts interview, one on I think October 28th, that and was then the first two, yes. November 3rd, where Youngblood I explained these allegations more than once. And so he's kind of named, although not explicitly, I think from the context, you can yes. discern that that Bishop Jakes is at least alluding to the fact that he considers Reed a co-conspirator in the, these allegations. Certainly that's how I, I read and interpret the complaint. And I, as you said, I read it. Uh, it's a 20 page complaint. It's a public document. If you look for it, you, you should be able to find it. It is a lawsuit that is filed in federal court in the state of Pennsylvania. Right, right. Pennsylvania, which is where uh, Pastor Youngblood lives, and that's where he resides. In the the Pittsburgh area. In the Pittsburgh, yes. And so I think um, in the conspiracy 
count is essentially that these a uh, couple of people, some known, some unknown, some named, some un unnamed uh, conspirators, got together to defame um, Bishop T.D. Jakes. That's mm -hmm. count two. So it's count two counts of that. Now I want to back up because you mentioned this before. You said there's an issue, a potential issue of statute of limitation because this happened almost 40 years ago. Why and, now, right? Right. So like I'm thinking, if this happened 40 years ago. Immediately, as an attorney, I'm thinking, well, the statute of limitations should have ran. Why is this coming up now? Why isn't the statute of limitations an issue right now? A bar? Well, that's, an, that's an interesting question, uh, Professor. The short answer is that in 2019, uh, the state of uh, Pennsylvania amended its statute of limitations regarding sexual misconduct with minors and our children or sexual abuse. So what a statute of limitations is, is the amount of time that you have from the time of the injury, the time of the harm or the wrongdoing to bring your lawsuit. For example, here in Florida, for most torts, again, what is a tort? A civil wrong. For most torts, you have four years. Some uh, torts, you have five years. Uh, and generally, that's how it is around the country. But uh, getting back to the 90s, maybe late 80s, with all of the uh, sexual abuse uh, cases that came about with the Catholic Church, many people, many rather many states began to consider and in fact did at some point expand the amount of time that uh, adults who were children at the time that they were abused uh, could have to file those um, charges, those, those lawsuits. In 2019, the state of Pennsylvania decided that they were going to expand it in this way, that you have until your 55th birthday, right? So it doesn't matter when it happened. If it happened when you were a minor, you have until the time that you are 55. The public policy is we're gonna give you every chance to, to hold the person that abused you accountable. And we're gonna give ourselves every chance to find those people who probably were still out there abusing over that 55 year period. 55 year period or that period of time between they abuse you and the time that you turn 55. So now what does that have to do with uh, young blood? Well, young blood is, was close to, or at the age of 55. So he was running up on that, uh, that statute of limitations. At least uh, that's what I've been able to surmise in terms of the research. Where, where, does, where do my facts come from? He talks about it. If you, if you look at the interview that he did with um, Larry Reed, he talks about the fact that he himself ultimately became a abuser and he was charged and convicted of and served time in prison for abusing a 16 year old uh, young man. And he says that it happened in 20, rather it happened in 2002. He believed it was either 2002 and 2001. And at that time he was 35 years old. So if you do the math, you know now that he's coming up on that time frame where he needs to file this complaint or he's going to forever lose it. So uh, that's why I think, and I don't know, I've never spoken to this gentleman, but I, in doing the math and hearing him talk about it and looking at the statute of limitations for Pennsylvania, it makes sense that this would be the reason why, why after 40 years, this would now be coming up again. Very interesting. So for him, it's not just, again, I'm just randomly throwing this up. It's probably something that he's been considering and he realized it's now or never um, to yeah. file this lawsuit. Seems to me that be the case, yes. I mean, that would make sense, right? It's like, uh, the deadline is, here's the, the actual statute of limitation for me. If I want to actually address this, now I have to do it. But you mentioned something that was, I think, important which is that he himself is a convicted sex offender. And this was mentioned in the lawsuit. Um, he admits it. Um, it's in the lawsuit mentioned several times about how he um, was accused. He's a lifetime sex offender. How do you think, do you think at all that it impacts him as a potential witness or a potential victim or an alleged victim? Do you think that that hurts or harms or this kind of, because in one sense, I'm thinking, well, People who are abused abuse other people. That does not mean that Jake's Bishop Jake's abused him. It just may mean he's been abused. Um, and it speaks to this sort of cycle. Do you think it sort of undermines his credibility? Because definitely in the, the complaint, they're alleging that he's just basically this criminal who's looking for a money grab. 
Or certainly the way that the complaint is written, it's certainly written to suggest and to not suggest, but to essentially say quite um, straightforwardly that this guy has no credibility because he is a child abuser, because he is a, reg a registered uh, sex offender. You know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, it, it, there's no way it can't weigh on and, and detect, uh, detract from and take away from his credibility. Of course it does. But as you've heard me say in, in many conversations, a couple of things can be true at once. Now, let me say again, I don't know what happened. There's only three people who know, who know actually what happened. God, uh, Bishop uh, Dwayne Youngblood, and Bishop T.D. Jakes. But if I'm looking at this as a lawyer, um, that is not, in the words of lawyers, dispositive. The fact that he is, that Bishop Youngblood is a convicted sex offender is not dispositive of whether or not his allegations are true. Right. As a practical matter, when you have anything like that, any kind of arrest, it's going to weigh on your credibility, right? So it's just a factor that is to be considered. It would then make me, as if I was being a decision maker, if I'm analyzing this, the allegations and weighing them out, I'm going to need to see a whole lot more evidence to, to believe this guy because this is one of those uh, negatives about him coming out of the gate. I think that that's how most human beings would see this kind of evidence. Right. Now, with that, I think what's at stake here, too, because you have Jake's filing his lawsuit first. But if you back up, you had allegedly Bishop Youngblood um, threatening to file a lawsuit. And right. it seems like Jake beat him to the punch. Do you think that was a kind of a strategically wise move to make? I mean, obviously, we don't have all the details. So it's to some degree it's impossible to say that to really right. answer that. Um, but it seems to me, and you can you read it as well, that they were trying to strike before a young blood struck and sort of get ahead and put the narrative out there. Do you think that was wise? Because now we're talking about young blood and his background. Mm -hmm. Although young blood talked about it himself too on the in, in Larry Reese, so it wasn't like it was something that he was hiding. Mm -hmm. Um, but do you think strategically, again, we don't know all the information, so like this may be impossible right. to answer. Do you think that strategically that makes sense if you know your client is going to get sued to strike first? Um, and then sort of get ahead of the narrative. Yeah. So the short answer is I don't know. And you've, you've stated correctly already. The reason why I can't actually say definitively is because I don't have all the information. And guess what? Those of us who are watching this, who have heard this, we may have some ideas and some impressions. But the reality is, as I said, there's only three people who know God, uh, T.D. Jakes and, and uh, Bishop Youngblood. Besides that, we can try to read the tea leaves. We can try to interpret the data, whatever data that there is. I'll say it this way, it, getting back to that statute of limitations thing, because I think that whatever community, because it's my understanding that there was some communication between T.D. Jakes and Youngblood uh, in the run up to uh, uh, litigation being initiated. And there was maybe some type of demand that has been characterized by the lawsuit as an attempt to extort, right? I mean, that's, uh, I believe if you read the statute, or rather you read the um, the complaint, there's a criminal statute that's actually cited in, in the lawsuit that talks about that being a crime. So th their theory of the case is that, that uh, Youngblood is trying to extort Bishop T.D. Jakes. Now, if I were presented with those set of facts, I would still be concerned about the statute of limitations because I know that if the person has gone beyond the statute of limitations, no matter what did or what didn't happen, it can't be brought up in court. It can't be sued on. However, I know from experience, and you know this as well as a lawyer, that if someone sues you, uh, you can file a counterclaim and recover on that counterclaim if you win even though the statute of limitations has already passed. So I'm not sure why that, that lawsuit was filed when it seems to be that Youngblood's ability to claim his uh, damages against T.D. Jakes had already expired or close to expiring. So 
you know, I, I don't know. I would have probably wanted more data before I would have uh, uh, filed uh, the lawsuit. And, and another reason for that, because when you file the lawsuit, it's a very public matter. And you, you certainly, in one sense, go beyond the point of no return. You know, uh, Brooke, as a lawyer, what the defense is and what the strategy is to defend against a defamation claim, right? Right. It's, the truth is an absolute defense. And that's the thing that I, I'm kind of baffled by, because even if the allegations, or, and I hope they're false, right, that Youngblood has raised, that they're false. That they're false. If we go to, if this actually goes to court, Youngblood can then bring in the truth or whatever that is, or, or support his allegations. So now, and other people who may have similar allegations can come in to show, oh no, this is the same thing, especially since we're dealing with sexual abuse. Cause normally you can't bring in certain character evidence, right? That's a 404 violation. But because this is a defamation suit, you can bring in character evidence to show that other people that have found him to do or that he did similar things to other people. So it's like you're bringing it into the public square in a way. I just am, I can't imagine this actually going to trial. Like this no. doesn't seem like a lawsuit that is set to really be litigated, but one to sort of scare someone or not scare. Or that stop is how them. I. Because you don't want this. To I'm not, we're not on the team. Right. No one has asked us our opinion. We're just talking about something because we think it's it's of great importance to the black communities, to the church. But. Tom, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes is is an icon, right, mm -hmm. in the Black community. Uh, and as I said up front, it, I'm, I'm saddened by the allegation. And if there's any shred of truth to it, it's going to be deeply devastating uh, and consequential uh, to, uh, to the church, church at large and to the Black church specifically. I was reading a passage um, I think it was Second Samuel, um, it, 12. chapter twelve, right? Where uh, Nathan uh, approached David after he committed adultery, and David said, "I've sinned against God." And 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 Nathan said, "Well, you're not going to die. However, because you did this, you give the heathen great occasion to bless me." Yeah. And, and that's a, a broader concern that goes beyond the scope of this conversation, beyond the scope of T.D. Jakes, whether he did it or he didn't do it. Whenever people who are high profile figures in the Christian faith fall short, right, mm -hmm. then it gives those who are non-believers, those who are um, skeptics, those who say, and you know them and I know them, who say there's nothing to religion, Anyway, that's why I stay home. That's why I don't go to church because y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. It gives uh, fuel to that fire. And in that way, it will be deeply devastating, anything like this. And, and let's face it, this church has had its crisis of a moral nature. And so no matter what we think about this, I think I would encourage everyone to be prayerful mm -hmm. about this and to be circumspect and not to draw any conclusions one way or the other. Since T P Bishop T.D. Jakes filed a lawsuit, the whole purpose of filing a lawsuit is to resolve controversies, to have a jury of your peers to hear the evidence. But I, and I, I don't think that's what he wants to have happen. Right. I, I, I don't think it's actually ever getting to that point. Especially, especially, I know that Youngblood at this point, I would imagine, will file a countersuit. Right. So it's a defense and a countersuit. And um, he gets to now bring in, again, uh, evidence to support his allegations, as well as other people who can say, oh, yes, the bishop did something similar. Even if they're not telling the truth, he can still parade them into court. And what can Jake's do? I just don't think that this is what um, I don't think it's what he intends it to be. I'm, I think he this in his mind is going to be settled. Um, and resolve before going to trial. I think that and would let's be say story. most. It's not just this case, but most lawsuits most are cases. settled. And that's most true. Lawsuits. That's not unique to him. Like that's. So yeah. I'll give him that. That's not unique. Most, the majority of cases, even criminal cases, are settled without trial because we literally don't have the court space and time. That that said, not enough judges, not enough court, court dates. Just not, not enough. Just that said, this case screams, we settled. shall we settle. <laughs> 
Michelle That's Pfeiffer. what I mean. Very quickly. We don't even want to get into discovery. And discovery is a process before litigation where you actually exchange information. You ask the person questions. They have to answer it and vice versa. You say, give me all of the documents you're going to use for trial. And I have to give you all the documents. You depote, take depositions. You bring people in, ask them questions under oath. That's called discovery. I don't even think they want to do that. You know what I mean? I don't think that process. I, mean, I, don't, want, I don't think the bishop wants to depose. For a myriad of reasons. If I if I were giving counsel to a person who's in uh, Bishop T.D. Jake's position, I would be telling that person this needs to be brought to a quick resolution. You know, you know why? Because he, there's a point of diminishing returns. You know, certain things, if you are accused of it, it's hard, no matter how it ultimately ends up, it is hard to recover your reputation. Right. And this is one of those things. Right. So my my thought is if I was to be confronted with a similar set of facts, right? We talk about fact patterns in, in as lawyers. Right. If I had a similar set of facts that I was working with, I would be looking for an early resolution because it doesn't it doesn't get us to the destination that we're trying to get to, which is restoration of my reputation, getting the church back to a, on a, on a plane of of normalcy, uh, where everybody that is is uh, attending my congregation is not feeling like they have to defend me because it's a major distraction, and that's just the small parts. I, hopefully, and I know that we will get to the spiritual aspect of this. Right. Um, so let's let's keep talking about it. Well, and that's actually where I wanted to go next. So we've talked about kind of the legal. I don't fully understand the strategy, but I don't have all the facts and all the information. Right. I can't imagine this going to trial. I think that would not be good. I think that would be a disaster. But I don't know all the facts. But you mentioned something earlier, which was very important. I think the key and the real thing that we want to pull out here, when you mentioned what happened in the book of Samuel, First Samuel or Second Samuel, mm -hmm. um, where Nathan says, you've given the unbeliever reason to blaspheme, blaspheme me, the Lord. Um, I, I think there has to be, scandal is not new to the church, as you were saying. Right. Not and new to vanity. Not, it, new to any, not new to people who are in positions of power. Right. Well, but, but specifically, because we're talking about the church, right. um, scandal is not new. And right. I think there has to be this whatever happened, I mean, young blood himself was a pastor who was um, messing with young children, right? So he abused young children. So if no, even if, no matter what happened with Jake, Bishop Jakes, we know at least with young blood he abused his position of power. And I think that is something he that went to prison for that. He went to prison for that, which is great that he was held accountable. But I think it speaks to a broader issue that's going on in the church, which is that you have these types of scandals where we know stay away from that deacon. He's a little weird. Um, he wants to hug a little too long. There's always the youth pastor that's just a little too friendly. And we all know these things, but no one says anything. And it's just kind of like, how do we resolve these internal issues? How do we protect our children? How do we protect um, teenagers? Because I think you even said that there's a range where people who are grooming, they they, they like to, to yeah. um, use when they're like going for particular people. So I guess what I'm saying is I think in the church, we have to do something about protecting the children, but also just protecting women and other people, vulnerable people in, in the church, because you're coming to church to get help and you're being preyed upon by people in leadership and everyone kind of knows, but we turn a blind eye about it. Um, I think so there's that issue. And then there's also a second issue, which is I think that there is um we have to be able to have a be, create a space in the church where people can come in and say, "I'm struggling with certain things," like, or "I've been abused," and they're not um, the shame of it is not something that they sort of feel that they they're free enough because I think a lot of these things happen where you have the abuser abusing other people and turning because there's shame attached to what happened to them, there's shame attached to what they're dealing with, so they hide it and repress it, and then that repressed and and, and um, hidden state sort of like the enemy just can beat, beat up on them and they're not able to be liberated when really they need to be able to find someone, not just anybody in church, but find a trusted confidant and say, look, this is what happened to me or this is what I'm dealing with. I need help. I need prayer. I need accountability. 
um, because when they're not being- well, There's a word there that you use that- yeah. right, you, know, those, not, you need to let that get down into your shando. There needs to be accountability. accountability. Because other, but I think shame keeps people from speaking up. And I think we need to have a space where people are not ashamed to say, I am dealing with whatever it is that they're dealing with, because that shame will keep them in bondage. And they'll end up doing things, I think, far worse than they would have otherwise if they had been able to be like, I'm dealing with this, help me. And then, so they're not, I just feel like it just feeds into, you know, you just, you're getting down the dark path. You just, you just, there's so many things that you said. I don't even know where to begin. You know, what's the answer? If we, again, if we knew that, you know, uh, we would be wealthy and famous and we're neither. Um, but, um, and, and really that's not even the goal, right? For me, I don't know about you. Um, I just want to be where God wants me to be. But let's talk about the church because if we're getting back to the, the, the statement that was made by, um, Nathan to Daniel, uh, to, to David rather. Satan. Now I'm all, I, I'm I've left the, the, the legal realm. You right. Know, you didn't see me change my hat. Now I've got my my pastor hat on. I put the, the lawyer hat in the closet. Satan, the uh, diablos, the Satan, uh, Lucifer, <laughs> diablos, whoever he is, he's all of those things. But I think Diabolos means the accuser. Well, the he, Satan means the accuser too. So Satan is the title. Yeah. yeah. He Satan. is constantly trying to undermine the credibility of God's people and God's work. Mm -hmm. Because if people get in their minds that they can't turn to the church for help, or if they've gone to the church, right, injured and wounded, and what happens, they're taken advantage of even more so. Yeah then it's lights out. Then Satan can, uh, he can devour them at his leisure. You know, it's kind of like a, a gator. I learned something about gators when I moved to Florida. Um, they don't try to eat the person up on, on the banks when they grab them or the dog or whatever animal, that the poor animal they grab, they grab them and they drown. They grab them and then they go into this death roll and then they go down. And then once that animal has been incapacitated, then they take them and put them in their nest and then they chew, them, chew on them at their leisure. And, and that's how the devil is in terms mm -hmm. of trying to drown people in the very place where they should be safe, in the house of God. Mm -hmm. So we've got to have some mechanisms, some proactive mechanism in, mechanisms in place to prevent people from being drowned and to to help people who might have their own um, propensities stay in place or be moved from place, move from place, because some people don't need to be there in, in the first place, right? I mean, some people are in the in the church and in positions of leadership, and they are there for all the wrong reasons. Right. They're there for power and status and, and prestige, and for financial gain. And and there's a legal term called adverse selection, which means the the people who should uh, be going toward ministry of the people who are loath to, to enter into ministry because they have a bad idea, a bad concept, a bad perception of ministry because they've seen so many crooked preachers. But the people who should stay 10,000 miles away from the pulpit because they are dishonest, because they're selfish, because they're self-absorbed, but because they are not in control of their flesh, those people tend to migrate uh, toward the church. And we need a mechanism in the church to sort out people who are coming in. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. When you say mechanism, do you mean like a structural thing? Because I'm immediately I'm going like, well, the Holy Spirit and discernment should be our internal mechanism. Like this person is all. Amen. Hallelujah to you, sister. Oh. sister girl. <laughs> I know about the Holy Spirit. He talks to me sometimes. I'm just saying that the discern so, discernment, uh, the, the initial. Let's, let's, what I mean, thank you for that question. It's a good question. What I mean, typically the denomination, if, if a church is inside of a denomination, the structure of the denomination manages that. For example, in, in Assemblies of God, if a pastor is accused of and found to be guilty of, uh, say, adultery, and I don't know what the standards are, but it used to be, to I don't know what they are today, but I knew that it used to be, that that pastor had to take an entire one year off 
and go through a process of repentance and reflection and, and then restoration. And then thereafter, he was put on some type of supervision where he had to check in. Now, I, that's, that's basic structure, right? So that does two things. That serves as a deterrent, knowing that if, if you're one of those people, if you're out there and you're thinking about doing what is wrong, then you know that there's going to be some holding account, holding you accountable, which is the word that you used a moment ago, right? Right. And so there is some deterrence factor to that. But then the other part of that is if you crash through the, the, the stop sign and you do it anyway, you're not going to be in a position to devour other people, hurt other people. So we have to have that structured. So, you know, if, if it's the Methodist, you know, it's going to be the bishop or if it's if it's the Presbyterian is, is going to be the prelate or the or the the cardinal or whatever structure, someone who's the bishop who's above. Uh, but what we see is when you have independent churches and their studies, not it's just it's not just Jerry Gurley's opinion, but when you have uh, independent churches that are not affiliated with anyone and therefore not accountable, that this kind of thing, again, not as assuming and not saying that we have proof that anyone has proof that in the case, the allegations that are made against uh, Bishop Jakes are true. But we do see that these kinds of things occur more frequently as it relates to pastors abusing church members uh, when churches are unaffiliated because there's no accountability structure. Well, you say, well there's, there's a board of directors, but- But, but more so than like the, what we saw with the Catholic church, you would think even those types of in Southern Baptist, they got caught up. Well, I don't know, it got caught up, but they it released not a few years back about so, these scandals so, there. So let me set, talk about that. The Catholic Church, um, that's a whole nother another conversation. But when someone was credibly, and that's the term that they use, accused of uh abusing a, a child very often, strangely, oddly, go figure men abusing not young women but boys what's up with that um what they would do it wasn't that they would just let the person go on and continue to do the abuse they would change him or her they would try to quote unquote rehabilitate him or her him it was always him yeah, it was men they they have with the catholic church and then they would uh send him on to another parish with the Southern Baptists, and this came out, what, two or three years ago, they had a list, a secret list of pastors that they knew or they had credible information to suggest that they were abusing uh, parishioners. Um, there again, what the Baptists do is they don't have a, a national, they do have a national organization, and yet Southern each Baptist church is autonomous. Right. So Baptist is different from just like Bap National Baptist. Well, national Baptist, Baptist is black. Is a black right, and, and, that, and American Baptist churches. What all of the Baptist churches have in common is that the board of trustees or the board of directors vote in or vote out the pastor, right? Mm -hmm. So when credible information comes, uh, they send the pastor on his way. Uh, the national organization keeps track of that, but they weren't telling people what was going on. But so the pastor just goes on. He's a journeyman. He just goes on to the next church. What I'm saying is what what distinguishes that from uh, what happens with these autonomous churches is that you don't have a board of directors to confront the pastor and to vote him out because typically they established the church, they handpicked the board members and some of them are their family members. So there's not gonna be any accountability that way. And right. therefore, whatever this behavior is, it continues. Well, you also mentioned something about so the assemblies of God and the structure that they have. Um, <clears throat> with you caught up in an affair, you know, you're out for a year. That's a euphemism. You <laughs> Call it what it is. Yeah, you had you can you sin, but my you committed my, adultery. Commit adultery, sin, whatever. The point is, because you said you have to have these mechanisms, and that all sounds reactive. I'm thinking what. Um, proactively can you have? So yes, it's a deterrent to some degree. So you have that in your mind, but how do you get, cause there's some, some, some people who have no intention on doing right. They see that, that structure, that mechanism, they're like, oh, I can go around that cause I'm smooth with it. 
right? So that's not going to deter them. How do you catch those people? Even people, again, who are pedophiles, who are drawn to the youth, they see all, obviously, an affair is not going to be, because that's the whole, when you're messing with children, that's not an affair. But they'll see those things and still think, well, I can get around it. And so how do you, that's why I say discernment is, is key. It's a very good question. And, 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 I, and what proactively can we do? So proactively, as individual Christians, and I have, I've been, I love the church and I love the Lord. He heard my cry, all that stuff. Um, but I had been churching for the last 59 years that I can recall, where I've been aware of what was going on and participating in, in a religious practice, religious uh, belief. Um, I can say with some degree of, of confidence that the one thing that we can do as individuals, as potential church members, is to make sure that we join a church and that we participate in a church that has an accountability structure for the pastor. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what we can do. Because otherwise, from the pastoral's point of view, I can get kicked out of XYZ church and go start another church. Literally, there's nothing that would prohibit me uh, the next day from filing my papers with you know the, the Secretary of State and opening up the worldwide church of God by fire coming through the flood and water. And now here we go. I, you know, I get my, my, my big cross and my, my white robe and Hey, there's no one that's going to hold me accountable because I'm the originator and the founder of this thing. And the, and the board that, that is, is created that the, say the secular authorities require me to have a board as a nonprofit organization. I'm going to pick grandma, grandma now. I'm going to pick my friend Pookie. You know, so I'm going to insulate myself from accountability. So really what I'm telling you is that the, the focus has to be from from the from the people up. These the, there are some things that the people should demand and expect of their leaders, of their religious leaders. I don't think that it's inappropriate uh, for us, as, for someone to say, if I'm going to attend this church, you know, no one wants uh, uh, to think that there's going to be a possibility that my pastor is going to have a moral failure, but I need to know, just like no one wants to have medical insurance, no one wants to buy life insurance, but there are certain realities uh, right. that we're confronted with in life. And this is a consistent problem that we've seen and we see that it's allowed. So let me let me modify my statement. Okay. That we see abuse uh, of authority in all churches, right? Whether they be in denominations or not. But we see that the, the condition, the, 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 the malignancy is allowed to metastasize uh, more successfully when there is no accountability structure. So therefore, if you're church shopping, you want to look for a church where uh, there is some actual accountability. Well, I mean, you say that and this is getting off, but like I'm thinking, how would someone know what's the accountability? Like if I'm visiting because I'm about to go start church shopping, if you will. Um, but yeah. I don't know if I would yeah. like go in and say, what's your accountability structure? Who's no, you don't that? ask them that question. And yes, pastor, what's your accountability that's structure? Right. But that's what you, you ask said. Him, the account, how would you ask? What, what, what is your, what is, who's this church affiliated with? It's the same question. You know, what, what they're affiliated with no one. That does not mean that they don't have. Historic, what I'm telling you, whether you like it or not, is that's a historically, that's historically a red flag. It means that if things, it's, it's like Jim Jones, and that's, of course, the most extreme. Mm -hmm. Jim Jones, I believe, you know, Jim Jones, 1978. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, and yeah. When he started out, I believe he was associated with a, a denomination uh, in Indiana. And then he moved his congregants out to San, the San Francisco area, and he became independent. And from Indiana to San Francisco, there was less count accountability, right? And then he moved those same congregants down to Guyana, and there was none. I'm just telling you, historically, when uh, we have, quote unquote, long rangers um, who are not genuinely being held accountable, then that's just a red flag. That's just a thing that you need to be cautious about. That's Jerry Gurley's uh, conclusion based upon 59 years of attending church and then being involved in church at all levels, from being the senior pastor to a staff minister, 
down to a person who's singing in the choir and literally sweeping uh, the church floor, um, there needs to be some accountability. And one of the things that you need to put at the top of your list when you're looking for a church to attend is what is this affiliations and association and what is the accountability? And, and it can't be an association of friends and pals who have like spirit. It has to be a genuine structure, for example, that if there are credible allegations brought, they will be investigated. And the body that is affiliated has authority to mm -hmm. take action to correct the problem. Again, I still think this these are questions that if you're visiting a church, if you're thinking about going to a church, I don't know how you work those questions in other than you don't work them in. You just again, it's simple. Is this church affiliated with any particular national or regional body? Yes or no? That's a yes or no. Right. But I don't think that to me, lawyer term, I don't think that's dispositive of whether or not this is a church that is um I shouldn't be a part of because I, but you know, I, I like that, use that term, uh, Professor. And it's fine, but then I've gone to churches where they had a structure and shenanigans were afoot. So I, I'm just saying, I think, but I don't think to your point, it's not a bad thing to be like, okay, you, you're independent, so I need to know if there's actual accountability here. There may be some other kind of accountability, but mm -hmm. there may not be. So that's a little. A yellow flag, I would say, not a red flag, but a yellow flag. I, I was also thinking on a very practical level. So there's what you can do as a parishioner coming into a church, right? Because you're right. There is a, some give and take between the leadership. Because I remember having a conversation with a friend, like, why do these pastors go off the deep end? I'm like, because they find people to just feed into their crazy. Like, you got to find somebody to be like, you look real crazy right now. That's the accountability. Okay. Let, let, think, let's but, go. but I think that that's also, and then the, the friend was like, well, it's also the people, the people let this person do these things, you know? So I'm thinking you got to have who, who's your close confidants who can tell you, you know what, you got something in your teeth, you look real crazy. But then there's also the people that you're leading also have to be like, um, this doesn't make sense. What are we doing over here? Why are we going to Guyana? Like sell my house? Like, so there is a give and take. I think there's that element to it, there's, which is discernment. At the end of the day, it's back to discernment, like I'm saying. But I was just thinking like on a very practical level, when you're trying to do the pro proactive, very practically, background checks. You know what I mean? Like, let's do background checks on the people who... Minimally. But there again, if you start the organization, are you going to do a background check on yourself? No, but I'm just saying, obviously, you're not, you know your background. But I'm saying if you're bringing people in to especially with working with the kids, background checks, not just the criminal, but then also listen to like other people that they've done ministry with, like that kind of investigative um, effort and, you know, investigation. It, it's, it's, it may be a lot, but it's just, it's not a lot when it comes to protecting the kids and protecting other people because people thought. talk. I, I got a thought. Um, Go ahead. If, if the minister is new in town, where were you? Where'd you come from? And then go on Facebook and investigate. What was your last church? Or, or here's a here's a more practical thing. Does this church have bylaws? Am I permitted to see the bylaws? Does this church have regular financial statements? Am I permitted as a member to see the financial statements? Right, the, more, the more uh, secrecy there is, the higher the, the risk that there's going to be uh, other things that that are not uh, tenable, things that don't comport with and comply with uh, spiritual uh, purity, and and I'm just talking. Some of it is my uh, personal experiences because I've candidly I, I've been in churches where the pastor has gone left, and one in particular, and committed adultery, and you know it, it was disastrous. And 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 I want to go back to this statement that that Nathan made to David, because I remember the one church that I was in and we were doing a lot to get men and, you know, because in black churches, men, they're, they're scarce, right? Particularly in black Pentecostal churches, but just black churches generally, men don't like to go to church. They want to watch football on Sundays and basketball on Sundays. It's not a priority so much as it is for say our black women. And our black women lead the way in many ways, and that's one of the ways. But so I remember this woman; she was on fire for the Lord, and she wanted to get her husband to go to church with us, and he was not having it, and he was reluctant to go to church. 
because he had that position based upon past experiences that all pastors, all they want to do is get a lot of money, eat fried chicken and run the women. Literally, that's what he told us. <laughs> I, I was an assistant pastor at that time. And finally, through a couple of Super Bowl parties uh, that we had annually, you know, he came, he ate some chicken wings. It was something in the sauce, I guess, that loosened them up. And he became an active member going to Sunday school and everything. And then this happened. This happened. And I remember the, that guy and it, 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 his words haunt me today. He said, I, 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 that's what I said. I am never ever going to church again. Hmm. And that's where Satan wants people to be mentally. Right. And that's why, even if you are a good and great person and that you are walking the walk to the best of your ability, you are a target. Because the reason why Satan wants to take leaders out is because it does, you know, it, it, it is so devastating on the faith of the followers. This is why even when there are leaders who are not doing the right thing, there are people and Jesus talked about that, I believe, in Matthew chapter 13, letting the, the tear grow with the wheat. Right. Because if he went in and pulled, pulled that tear out at that moment, it would, destroy it would the also uproot the, the wheat. Right. And then you may have heard me say this before. Just because God is using you don't mean he's excusing you. I have another sermon type, but we'll keep mine separate. All right. But, yeah. No, I don't like your I know you. <laughs> it's the same yeah. concept. In fact, I mean this in love as my daughter to you. I rebuke yes. you. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. you rebuke yes. that title. And I it's, it's biblical. It's biblical. Yeah. yeah. Coming from numbers. We're and we're moving on. Back to the 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 um conversation. So um Again, we don't know what happened here, right? I mean, well, we well but we I want to end with this last point. Um, mm -hmm. which we don't know what happened. We're still dealing in the spiritual. One thing that came up as I'm reading this, you have a bishop suing a pastor, so a pastor suing a pastor. Mm -hmm. And immediately I'm thinking about the verse in what's First Corinthians uh, chapter six. Six, six, one six. through six. One through six about how we shouldn't be suing each other in secular courts. Mm -hmm. What is this about? Like, does, does that mean, does that, do, do those verses actually mean that we shouldn't be, this lawsuit shouldn't go forward? Is, is, is Bishop Jake sinning by not, by filing this lawsuit? Is that what this means? Or so, something else going on in that passage or, or what, what's happening here? What that's a good think? question. No, I don't think it means that there's a straight up prohibition against Christians suing other Christians. Think about World War II. It was one quote unquote Christian nation fighting and killing another, right? I mean, Germany was a Christian nation, still is today, fighting mm -hmm. against England, which was a Christian nation. That was World War I, that was World War II. Uh, the Civil War, Northern Christians, Southern Christians. So it's, it's, it wasn't that. It was the idea that because if we are mature enough, if we are spiritual enough, if we have enough of God's word in us. That's Paul was talking about the best case scenario. He wasn't laying down an absolute, uh, what lawyers call bright line rule. Uh, mm -hmm. He was simply saying, look, yeah, if y'all were half as spiritual and half as studied and, and half as rooted and grounded as you should be, you should be able to resolve these, these small controversies between you. Let's admit these allegations that have been raised in in Bishop T.D. Jake's uh, lawsuit are not small. Right. right? I was going mean, to say that. These aren't actually they small. Are, they're, they are profound. Here's why. If you are a pastor and you sin, you go out and you shoplift at Kmart, uh, should she be kicked out of the ministry? No, nah, I don't think so. But you, you might, probably need to be monitored. Right? You might want to sit down. You might want to have a seat because why are you stealing? And and yes, you will not be the one counting the offering, but that doesn't that's not a completely disqualifying um, event. But if you are a pastor and you commit adultery, as the case of the Assemblies of God, which we talked about, then you do need some time out. 
it's punitive, but it's also to, to get you back, hopefully restorative, to get you back to where you need to be. So you're not written off. I think stealing is also, you need to be in timeout, but go ahead. But yes, no, perhaps on the shoplifting scenario, you may need some timeout. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's not like disqualifying, meaning you can't serve in ministry ever again. That's what I mean when I use that term. But if you sin, if you are the pastor and you sleep with a parishioner, or you do something inappropriate, now it is approaching the disqualification because if you are addicted to lamb chops, then you should not be a shepherd. You can't be a shepherd. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, and that's that's not super spiritual. That's super practical. Right. right. You have revealed something that it, that should be in you is not there. The ability to say no to your flesh, the ability to not cross a line, not to see these people as God sees them as his property as his people. You are sinning not just against this person, you are sinning against God himself. You're sinning against the faith when you use your position of power in the church uh, to, to violate your covenant with your wife if you're married. And to, in many cases, some of these allegations are that you, people are violating their covenant with their wife and with someone else's husband. So, I mean, it's just power. Like Jim Jones and 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 David Koresh, if you remember that cult down there in Texas, yeah, Waco, Texas, Texas, and just many, many, many others, right throughout history, recent history, distant histories, people, human beings have been doing the same thing for quite some time. But the ultimate, to me, is if you use your power as a pastor to uh, abuse children. Mm, yeah, I, I don't see how that can't be anything but a disqualifier, right? Right. Because now you, you, you've shown that there's something perverse, there's something dark, there's something that doesn't emanate from the kingdom of God, but in fact originates, in the words of my dear mother, from the pit of hell that is active and, and, and operational in your life that is going to, to serve not as a malignancy in the church, but as, a, as an explosion, as a, as a stick of dynamite, as a hand grenade going off in the congregation. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it. I've seen it happen, literally. Happen. But, but still, it gets to the question, though. Okay, so there's this abuse, the allegations of abuse. You have this verse from Paul saying, don't go on the court, secular courts, to, to resolve your disputes. <clears throat> what do we do? Because this isn't a criminal case. Obviously, if it's a criminal mm -hmm. case, then it's, it's yeah. in the what do you you think we should have some internal? And this may be going back to what you said before about internal mechanisms yeah. to deal with it. Let, so, first of all, the first, some of the first courts in the West, you know, the, at one point the Catholic Church had what they call chancery courts or ch courts of equity. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Like in, in, in the United States, there were two kinds of courts, the courts of law and courts of equity. The courts of equity were run by the church. The, the goal of the law is to do what is legal, but everything that is legal is not always just and right. So the, 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 the chancery or the, the courts of equity they could do what was right, what was fair. So, and they were run by people who were not lawyers, they were priests in some instances or some other uh, trained professional. So I think there's already been some history of that happening. And if you know the Church of God in Christ as well, um, the church that I grew up in, um, they actually have their own court system. You know, they have, uh, if you are accused, you, you are entitled to a trial and, you're entitled to present evidence. You're entitled to representation. So I, I'm a strong proponent in, as a lawyer and as, as a pastor that there needs to be internal alternative dispute resolution um, that is formalized in the church. Because, see, the world has a standard that, in my view, is below the standard of God's word. So a person can be acquitted because... Uh, the accuser didn't meet its burden of proof, but that don't mean that the person uh, did, was not done wrong. So I think that we need to have people who are saved, if I'm talking again in the Kojic terminology, uh, sanctified, filled with the precious Holy Ghost, a mighty burning fire with a mind to run on and see what it's going to be like in these last and evil days. We need to have people who are connected to God, weighing issues, 
weighing the evidence prayerfully and coming to decisions, there needs to be a formal, a formal structure. Discernment. Uh, where, um, and, and you, you're talking about independent discernment. Well, no, I'm saying that whole weighing process is a, is a discerning process as well. Oh, yes, yes. But see, that. so again, let's let's take uh, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes out of this conversation yeah. and let's put in Bishop Jones, okay? Well, actually there is a Bishop Jones, by the way. Uh, Bishop, let's come up with a Bishop that's made up. I don't know. Bishop uh, Rightfoot. Bishop Rightfoot. Let's put Bishop Rightfoot in this. Uh, who's going to investigate the allegations if there's no lawsuit? Who's going to investigate the allegations made against Bishop Wrightford? And determine, because see, it, it works for both people, right? If, as I said, if someone has accused me of, of molesting boys, that thing, whether I win or lose, is going to stick with me, right? It's going to damage my brand, my reputation, my family's going to all of us are going to be operating on the cloud of suspicion. So if I am able to go through some type of investigation and clearing process that's done by the church, it helps, right? It's not a harm. It's not a danger. If I've not done anything wrong, then I should see it as a, as a positive thing. But what I know just from being a minister and talking to many ministers is that's the last thing that most ministers want is to have this, but it's the one thing that we need. And I'm and I'm including Jerry Gurley in this as an active minister. We need to have accountability mm -hmm. formalized. And I think that that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 talk about. He says rhetorically, yeah, he raises two questions. No, you're not, that we're going to judge the world. Then he goes one step further, which I've always found to be astounding. You know that also we're going to judge angels. So if 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 the Christians, the church is going to judge angels, then we should be able to sort this out. That's my point. Well, that was Paul's point, too. <laughs> right. And so it, whether it be a minor uh, disagreement or something of a more serious magnitude, even if there is no charge brought in terms of criminal charge or a lawsuit, which is a tort, a civil charge, I think that when certain allegations have, have, or have been made, there has to be a mechanism within the church to, to look at it and to reach some conclusion. I agree. So I just, so then just to conclude, do you think therefore that the, um, the lawsuit should have been filed or they should have at least tried to do something on the uh, outside of the secular courts before. And maybe he felt like he couldn't, but do you think that this is something that should not have been filed? It's, it's, past it's, world, it's uh, and, and I, I'm going to keep saying, you're not going to get me with the banana and the tailpipe. I don't have enough information, but if, if what, from what I do know, what I've read, cause I've, I'd spent hours researching this. I try not to just, go flying by the seat of my pants. From what I have been able to glean from the information that I've read, I don't think that I would have been counseling my client with these set of facts to go running into court and file in a lawsuit for a couple of reasons. So no, I would have tried to resolve it through informal means if I could, not just for the sake of my reputation. When I'm a national figure, keep in mind other people are gonna be affected by this. And that's why I started out with my statement. If this is true, if it is true, then it's going to be uh, profoundly devastating to uh, the church and particularly uh, black Christians because he is an icon. He is a preaching and teaching uh, machine. He is anointed and, and gifted in many different ways. Not singing. It's not one of his <laughs> but in many different ways he is a gift to the church and I just I have been praying for for about this since I've heard these allegations and I'll continue to do that and that's what I encourage people to do here yeah. I agree I agree at the end of the day we need to pray this is a time to pray mm -hmm. and then to also check ourselves because it's easy to be like oh that's why I don't go to church and that's why it's like no 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 
as I was saying to some friends the other day, any of us could find ourselves caught up in, again, I'm not saying that the bishop is, but any of us could be caught up in something if we do not guard, as granddaddy says, unguarded strength is double weakness. That's right. Let's also use this for me. It's like, okay, let me check, do a, a check on myself to make sure that I'm not like uh, Nathan said to David, giving the um, unbeliever a reason to, to speak against God. Um, so yeah, this is a time to pray, be introspective and say, Lord, search me, search mm -hmm. me. So, and for those of you who might be out there saying, wow, I knew it. There was something about him. And that's why this is not the time to be spilling the tea. And if any of it is true, it's not going to make you more spiritual. Oh, come on. Lord. Right. We need to be praying about this. Our concern should be the health and the life of the church and the uplifting of God's great name. Right. And that's what it's about. And that's why we decided to come on. I, this story, I'm sure, is going to continue to unfold. And when it does, I'm sure we'll be back to discuss whatever updates come out. In the meantime, if you want to, please follow us, like and share this video with other people. Until next time, I'm Brooke. This is my dad, Pastor Gurley. Thank you for watching. See you next time.